And we have Marjorie. <laughs> All right. Uh, I actually have two different ones, and I'm trying to decide which one to go with. Um, we'll go Heck, with you can tell them both. That's fine. You can do one now and do the other later. I'll do the other one later. So I'll do the, the, the short one first. So this harks back to, oh, 1984. Woohoo! I didn't have big hair back then either. Um, <laughs> here's a lesson to be learned. So at the time I'm with my boyfriend and we're driving down. Now I know it was Highway 5, closer to Old Town and all of a sudden, woo, 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 blaring lights. It might actually have been a different highway, but it doesn't matter. But here's the point. When you get pulled over, even if you're the passenger, and of course, of course, because we were from A to B, and I had a lot of tea probably to drink, very full bladder. So this is setting the tone. I immediately get out of the car and after because I said, I need to use the ladies room. And it was a male officer who pulled us over. Mistake, mm -hmm. because that was a red light, a red flag for, oh, she has something she needs to get rid of. It's not just a bathroom call. So they had to call in a female officer. So I had to wait another 20, 30 minutes hoping not to sneeze so never ever <laughs> yeah i mean my eyes are starting to bug out and finally the the gal shows up she pulls up she brings me into the ladies room she pats me up and down and when you really have to pee that's not a good thing to have happening to you so she finally left and realized that i was completely the innocent gal that I am and looked. <laughs> so always hold your hold your thoughts. <laughs> and I finally did get to go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie. Hello, David. Hello, gang, boys and girls. <laughs> you made it just in time. That was our first story. What's it? Awesome. I'm glad I caught the last uh, 35 seconds of it. I just know that Mar Marjorie, did you stay out of jail after that? Yes, I did. Did you manage to? Yeah, with the face like this, of course. <laughs> yeah, good to, good to see your face again, too. Hi, everybody, boys and girls of all ages. What's happening with you guys? Tracy? Yeah. I work, uh, what planet are you calling from the planetarium? Where are you? Um, I, oh, yeah, that's my background. Calling from Queens. <laughs> that's right. Queens, not far from Mars. Um, I'm sorry, is that Rita, Rita Mooney? This is why, this is the part of the show where I uh, introduce myself like we've known each other a long time, Rita. David, okay. it's so good to see you again. Have we met before? I don't know. I, Maybe. It is good to see you again now. <laughs> it's good to see a form of everybody, isn't it? Rita, where, Rita, Rita, where are you? Because you look like you're far away, but you might not be I as far as the galaxy. This is one of those Zoom backgrounds that make me look so smart. Wow. They're, they're getting better at it because that actually looks like your home study over there. Pretty good. Somewhere I in Oregon now. Yeah, San Diego College. Right, Oregon. you look you look very Pacific Northwest today. Yeah, it does look very green and pretty there. Right, um, Adam, Adam Greenfield, how are you? Great, how are you? Good man. We've met before, no? Maybe, probably. Probably, I'm terrible with. I'm good with names. I'm good with faces. I'm not good with putting names and faces together. You're like me. You always feel. I always feel like I walk into an Alzheimer's unit, and I'm just introducing myself like we had met before. Right, you never right. say I don't remember you. You just go, "Good, how are you, Adam?" Well, it's it's good to see you after all these years. It's been a while. It's been yeah. at least a month. Adam, Adam, where are you? You've been here I'm, before, though. I'm here in South Park, San Diego. Actually, yes. I, I, my background is my. They did really well with it. My home. So yeah. Um, Very nice. Do you play that guitar? I do as often as I can. I've got another one over there. So 
Very good, man. Those, are good, those are good bookends. You know, just don't want to use them for decoration. Good to see you. No. There. Yeah, I try to play them. Yeah. Right? So we've only got through, we've gotten through one story. Excuse my, uh, pardon my uh, tardiness. Um, there was actually, on my way home, there was a police raid going on in the neighborhood. And uh, it took a while to get through. Um, lots of cops, like lots. No sirens, no lights, just like waiting outside someone's um, driveway. David, where are you? I, I blame society is what I'm doing. I'm blaming society right now for my tardiness. <laughs> so that's, that's legible, right? It's a literal interpretation of call of the wild. That's right. That's right. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before um, and are still readers, um, this is Long Story Short. It's where people that are too perhaps lazy to write these things down and just tell the story the way they remember it. You may or may not have rehearsed your story. Either way, um, just like you, uh, we have no idea what we're going to hear tonight. And I think, I think that's the magic of it. Because again, we get a bunch of strangers in the room and we talk about uh, something that happened to us. Um, and as we all know, if you don't tell your side of the story, the other person in your story is telling it across town what they're making you look like the asshole in the story. So this is a legitimate way to redeem yourself. If not only for the five or six of us in this room right now, it works well. Um, let me ask you, Jennifer, did you write these names down? Do we have some names to go through or are we just gonna? Yes, I did write some names down. And uh, yes, so like I said, that was the first story we had Marjorie, um, but Marjorie's gonna tell another story later. So her name is gonna go back in the pile, but I have the other oh, names here good. ready to pull from. Shall we That's, move on to our, our second yeah, story? I feel like we're doing ski shooting. Just pull it. What do you say before you pull the clay pigeon? What is that word you use? I think it's pull. Pull. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Sorry again. Kittens stepping on keyboard. Oh, that's oh, that was a prop. We all know that. Yeah. How many more covers? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask you, oh, how many more of those do you have as he entered the screen again? Another one. <laughs> just two. Okay, here we go. Next we have Adam. Adam. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll just make up a fake bio on Adam. Adam is an uh, ex-guitar player for Led Zeppelin. Um, <laughs> he lives in oh, South Park now. Um, not to be confused with Colorado. It's the one here in San Diego. Um, Adam, how did you hear about this format? So, uh, so, so we all enter this format. Oh, I've I've been uh, I've been kind of involved in the writing scene for about a decade now. Yeah. Um, I have a book of poetry published through Puna Press and Ted Washington. Oh. Um, so I'm I'm and I know Justin and I know yeah. So I'm I'm involved in in it. I just haven't done the vamp and so say we all stuff yet. So. Well, any. Uh, also, any, I don't. Any, yes. I also, um, as far as rock and roll legends, the only one that I know in San Diego is um, Rob uh, Halford. Oh, of Judas, course. Judas, Judas Priest. Priest. Yeah, that's, that's, yes. that's the only one I know. You know, I love uh, Judas Priest. And um, I was driving my motorbike home tonight and I listened to music and I had Breaking the Law come on. And it's such a great song to ride to because um, even though I'm just on a, uh, a 350 cc scooter i feel like i'm a, a 1200 harley davidson with rob halford on back screaming for it's all, it's all up here. Oh, hell bent for leather for sure yes yeah, right. it's, it's all how you feel up there it's not it's not yeah. how you look doing this it's all up here that's you're right committing, you're committing petty misdemeanors <laughs> that's right that's right um again welcome any uh friend acquaintance of ted washington um the guy runs a great show with his uh, open mic over um I'm hoping he's coming back to the um, uh, La Bodega, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, they, they got. They have two studios now, I believe. One in I know in Barrio Logan, but I think they opened up another one in Seaport Village. So I don't know if they're going to do where. I assume they'll probably do it back at Barrio Logan again. But yeah. Um, right. Well, welcome. I'm glad to have you aboard. I'm glad you can make it and everybody else. Whenever you. you're ready, you let it rip, man. All right. 
uh, I guess to set the scene, it's um, Bonnaroo 2004. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bonnaroo, it is a multi-day concert event in Tennessee. Um, I believe just outside of Nashville, but really in the middle of nowhere. So <clears throat> there's about three caravan, three cars in a caravan that drives down from Iowa to Tennessee. Um, there's about 12 of us, 10 or 12 of us. We get there, we set up camp. Everything's great for a day or so. And if, um, if you're not familiar with the area, it's just this wide open private land, but it's just a field. There's a lot of hay, there's a lot of mud, but it's just wide open. Um, so all the cars are parked, we set up camp, everything's good. First day is fine. That second day, which is a Friday night, uh, it's humid, very humid. And the next thing you know, it's just a downpour of rain. And I mean, torrential rain that I've, I've lived through hurricanes and this, I thought we were in a hurricane. Um, wasn't as windy, but just heavy rain. Ground is saturated with mud. It just keeps raining all night. So that Friday night, we go back to our camp, camping area. I get in the tent. I try to go to sleep, um, but you know, you're at a loud event with everything. I do finally fall asleep, but when I wake up, it's about three in the morning and there's an inch of water in the tent. And I'm soaked, like the ground is soft. Like the guy next to me is just snoring away, oblivious to the entire thing. So I get up and since I drove, I was like, I'm just gonna sleep in my car. I wasn't really a big fan of camping anyway. So I get up, I go in, in my car and I just get as much sort of sleep as I can. The next day, Saturday, it stops raining, but everything is mud and it's just a mess. So we go through that night. I wake up Saturday night at three in the morning, starry skies, but I realize I haven't done anything more than pee since we got there. So I was like, and I, my stomach was letting me know this. So I was like, I better, I better go figure this out. But I don't like porta potties. They just, they, they scare me. There's something about them I just don't like. So I'm, I, I grab a, a roll of toilet paper and I'm like, all right, let's just conquer this fear and then do what I have to do. And as soon as I get there, there's this long line of, of porta potties, but I got there right in the nick of time because they were cleaning them all. So I stood there with my roll of toilet paper, waiting for the one, I was the first one in line waiting for it to be cleaned. And I'm just like sitting there, my stomach is just gurgling and I'm just like sweating, you know, and I'm just really uncomfortable, you know, that feeling you really got to go, but you're uncomfortable. And I'm just standing there with my, my golden roll of toilet paper. Finally, it like opens up, I go in and I sit down and I listen to Primus at three in the morning while we're leaving myself. And it was probably the best 10 minutes I think I've had in, uh, in my lifetime. So there it is. That's a good story. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your porta party in your porta potty. I've never been in one since, and I don't plan on going one again. But unless they're like freshly cleaned, which is advice for you. There you go. Yeah, um, they 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 never do clean them. The only time they're clean um, when they're right out of the factory. The first uh, thirteen hours, they're fine. They're great. Um, yeah, it's by far the most disgusting hellhole. Um, it's the worst. Classic. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Anna. No Thank you. Let's do another one. Who's Heather? Why can't we not see her? She's mysterious. I'm Heather. I'm just here to learn. Actually, the water's been turned off in my house all day, so <laughs> I'm kind of gross from my morning workout. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Nothing a little saliva across your forehead won't won't relieve, right? Well, That's okay, yeah. Heather. We won't pressure you. Thank you yeah. for joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining. It would have been awkward if you just sat in silence. That would have been bad. But nice to meet you, Heather. We know you, don't we? We're all friends here. You're from the whistle stop. I was pretty pretty faithful at the whistle stop. I was always front. Nice, Heather. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, did you have a story to join us with as well? Nope. Just Fair listening. enough. Fair enough. We 
Um, All right. So you want to do you want a, uh, a bio first, or do you want the name first? Let's go with a bio. Okay. Oh, I, I was waiting on you to do the bio. Oh, who's the person? Okay, so name first. Okay, name first. Yes. We have Rita. Lovely Rita, Rita May. Uh, Rita, do you get that a lot when it comes to your name? Um, the 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 Beatles reference a lot. It's getting less and less that I hear that. The, the, the more that people die, the, the better it is for you. I don't They're know. Not I, I, it. I love the Beatles. And I, there was a photo of the meter made in a Beatles album or a Beatles book, and she looked pretty hot. So I was okay with it. She, she was quite attractive in my mind, just based on the lyrics. Yeah. You're here in San Diego. Um, have you done, have you done, um, after serving your, uh, what'd you get, like 30 years back in the 70s? Trying to yeah. kill John Lennon or something like that? What was that? 30 years back in the 70s? For... This is part of, your, this is part of your, your, your wrongful biography. Yeah. Um, Rita, what do you do? What is it you do all day? Uh, am I making this up too? No, no. Oh. I work for Helix Water District. I do administrative support. Yes and take calls from customers who have meter problems or water running down the street or knocked off fire hydrant. That's great. Let me ask you a question. How come my water bill was triple than it was last year? Um, water prices are going up every year. It's going to be a five to 7% increase just because there's not a lot of water. So when there's a little bit of something that it costs more and oh. We're running out of water. Actually, you know what? We're going to be in a, we're getting into a pretty troublesome drought coming up right now. So yeah, you're paying for the infrastructure. It's funny. We have the one thing that we asked you to use less of and that you have to pay more for. It's really quite strange. You know, it's funny because I, I thought water was the most abundant thing in the world. Like my, you know, doesn't yeah, grow on trees. It, we're all made of it, right? We're water. Yeah. You guys are drinking coffee like it's water. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, well, thanks. I'll accept your answer. And uh, <laughs> sounds like you're kind of rehearsed with that one, right? Part of work. Um, th <laughs> thanks for joining us, Heather. Whenever you want to start, you let us know and you just go. Okay. Okay. I joined the Army when I was 17. Um, they had a career fair at my high school and I signed up to win to, to receive a pair of free tube socks. That's how they got me. I actually, when I was filling out the little form, I'm like, I'm, not, I'm just getting a free tube socks. I am not joining the army. My parents were liberals. We were protesters. We had that little, um, it was a cute little emblem you wore that said war is not healthy for children or other, other living things. And um, my mom would say, let the Pentagon hold a bake sale for bombs and, you know, give them money to schools. And so I was really not into joining the army because I was like really into um, killing people or defending my country. Um, and I wasn't even going to join it, but dang, that was a good recruiter. He got me. And I think it was the timing because I was really sick of school. I was really tired of it. And I was going to be graduating and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was no longer going to be covered under my father's health insurance policy. And for some reason at age 18, I cared about, or 17, I cared about that. And uh, it was alluring, you know, you can travel, you, uh, get the spin, you're going to get, you know, a place to stay, meals, education. It's a wonderful thing. And they were doing this um, back then, this was the early 80s, and the army military had a bad taste in people's mouth. It was post-Vietnam, and they were mostly, the people who joined the army were getting out of going to jail. Uh, that was about it. Do you want to go to jail or the army? So I was part of this recruitment of, let's get young people who are, you know, college bound and, and, and um, kind of use them as propaganda to get other people um, into the military as well, just besides the people who don't want to go to prison. So um, went in August from Detroit via bus to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and 
uh, all the guys I was on the bus with right after we got to the, the depot, um, they all got their heads shaved and I, I recognized nobody, everybody looked alike. And in fact, I had long hair like this and I, you know, they had given us our uniform and explained what we had to do. And I knew that wearing that, trying to pull my hair up and doing everything else was going to be impossible. So a woman that I was, a, a fellow recruit used, I believe, toenail scissors to cut my hair, cutting my ear in the process. And I, I sent hair back home to all my friends and the, you know, suburbs of Detroit. And these were all um, people who were going to college and they would write me and you're so brave. You're going through this. I'm, I'm complaining because I'm in college and I'm having a tough time. But um, so I had a lot of support and encouragement from people back home, folks back home and letters. And um, I, I, when I signed up, I was going to be, I signed up to be a telecommunications center operator. And I think when I heard communications, I thought it was um, something to do with TV and radio or something like that, because that's what I was into, but it was not that at all. It was teletype, so I became a very good typist. But before I got my specialty training, I was in basic training, and there's this moment that you go from that induction depot station to um, you're going to your barracks, and we, you have your gear, you have your duffel bag, and you are you have to run everywhere and you have to run you we, we, are, we ran into this cattle car and so i'm in this cattle car in this humid south carolina my my new camouflage fatigue sticking to me and and standing close to people nothing to hold on to rocking on this cattle car and i'm like what am i doing here what am i doing here this isn't me it was kind of, and Private Benjamin had just come out like a couple of years before. And I really was a lot like that. I wasn't as rich as Goldie Hawn, not near, you know, nothing like that. But I was a nice little suburb, suburban girl. Like, what am I doing here? So um, I really tried to be a good girl and do really well. And this one time I forgot to lock my wall locker. And I was, my drill sergeant called me in his office and I just turned, I was so humiliated and upset with myself and I turned red and I was sobbing and crying. And he's like, there's no crying in the army, Mooney. And I knock it off. And I had to compose myself. <laughs> and um, this was really hard because I was the crybaby of my family. Ask any of my siblings. And I actually did stop crying at that point. And it was later after I got out of the army that I had to relearn to cry. And I'm doing a good job again, you guys, in case you were worried. But, so the camping story is when we were on bivouac and you, um, you're with your buddy and you're all out, you know, out there uh, with your pup tent. The pup tent is the size of a queen size blanket and you and your gear and your buddy are all in there. And I have this thing where um, I guess I sleepwalk and I, I'll get up, but I'm also kind of hysterical and I think something's going on and I have to protect everyone. Um, this has gone out throughout my life. Um, I'll start yelling about things. So in this case, with all the excitement and stress of being in the military where you have, you, you know, you have lot, you know, you've seen this, you've seen the, the stories in the movies where you're up all night and you get very little sleep and you have to become one cohesive unit and um, you're really fatigued and, and overwrought and go through a lot of training. So it's very stressful. So I'm I, in my dream state. I, um, I think some, I hear something and I actually in my little pajamas, I low crawl out from underneath the pup tent and I have my rifle with me and I stand out there in front of my, my uh, tent. I'm, oh, who goes there? Oh, who goes there? And they're like, well, what's going on? And this woke up my buddy and she comes out and she's like, Mooney, Mooney, wake up, wake up. It's okay. And when I do these sleepwalk things, it, it's like, it takes a little, you're like, 
uh, you're in another place and you think something's going on and is that really what's what's really happening so it took a little bit and came to and um, luckily I didn't fire and luckily they don't give you live ammunition when you're doing these training things so I did graduate basic training thank goodness and it was really close because I was terrible at PT and physical training. I was a drama student, not an athlete, damn it. And I almost couldn't do those um, push-ups the way you have to do push-ups. I just really made it by the skin of my teeth and I did graduate and I did serve my time. I got to go overseas. I got to go to Germany. And when I got out, I did go to the great American peace march. So I do think I even things out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, Rita. And just like in the Army, we're just going to call you Mooney. I like it. You have a great last name because if your name was anything else, they would just nickname you something like Mooney. <laughs> so it works out really good, right? Thanks, Rita. Um, I just want to segue from that and talk about a little bit about um, Suicide We All and uh, what it does and uh, the opportunity that it gives a lot of people, uh, not just as storytellers, but as, as listeners and be able to put ourselves um, in the storyteller's shoes because we've all been there wherever that is once before. Um, I walked into um, uh, a Suicide We All event. It was actually this show, uh, long story short, and it was. Um, obviously in person, and I didn't know anybody there. And I walked in, I had a story to tell that I would never tell anybody else. Like, would never tell, share this story with anybody um, uh, based on, I didn't want to feel judged on the truth that I was telling in the story, because um, if you're really telling your story, you're, you're, you're being vulnerable and you're, it's warts and all, and those, those make good stories. Um, and I showed up at this thing and I put my name on a list and they called my name and I went up and told the story that I would never tell anybody if I knew you. So I really appreciated the uh, strangers that were there, you know, it was, uh, just a room full of strangers and this is the magic that works um, when you're telling your story. You're, you're not doing it to, to impress your friends and family who come out and see you, although they might maybe tell them, but I prefer not to do that. I, I really think it's such a great, world where you can just tell a bunch of strangers because you don't feel judged and you aren't no matter what you're talking about um unless you're putting yourself um in a story that where nothing bad happens it's just that you're the hero of the story and that's just a shitty story that um but having done that um i really got a taste for like well i really felt good after telling that story kind of purged me and went to another one and next month and next month and someone encouraged me to write that story down and submit it to um to a vamp show for another social development and um it's it's really great when you you take something that's been inside your 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 heart and in your head of course and you put it on paper and uh you really start to get vulnerable if you spend some time in your story you really start to see where you have defeated yourself in so many ways but now you're at a point to talk about it. So obviously it's very therapeutic and it was for me. Um, and then you submit the story and then you get an email back and it says, we really enjoyed your story. We would love for you to come on stage and tell it to everybody. And we'll give you a, a writing coach and a performance coach and we'll help you deliver the story the way you want to. And we'll give you like 10 or 12 minutes, whatever it is. This is like one of the oldest forums in the world, but it's very rare that we, we have an organization like so, so we all that, that will actually give you the microphone and let you do that. Um, and the encouragement is, is, is wonderful. So having done a bunch of stories through VAMP uh, and then have the opportunity to either um, uh, coach someone with performance and or writing, it's, it's just every time um, and I've helped a lot of people with their story, every time I go into it, I'm thinking, I don't have the time to do this, but like almost always, 99 and a half percent of the time, 
10 minutes into it, I'm like, I would rather be nowhere else in the world right now than listening to your story and what you're talking about. Because I know the joy that gives me, uh, and in reverse, it's it's just, it keeps, it keeps me so, so satiated, so good. So I just want to encourage you guys, um, whether you have or not before, is to write down your stories and submit them. And, and you'll get a neat letter that says, I'll be really enjoyed your story. Or, and this happens too, and to me, you know, oh, we, we, we didn't particularly care for your story this time, you know? Um, but even then, um, you'll go back and, you, and you'll, somebody wants to hear your story. That's my point. Someone wants to hear your story. We, we really want to hear your stories. Um, as you might know, uh, Rita, we also do stories for veterans. Um, and I, I just want to hand it over to Jennifer and let her explain a little bit more about that opportunity through um, incoming. Thanks, David. Thank you for saying that. Um, I agree with all of that, what you said. It's a, it's a good feeling to get involved as a storyteller and then it's a great feeling to keep going and be involved as a mentor too um, and producer. Um, but yeah, Rita, we have a program called the Veteran Writers Division, and it, it's pretty much like VAMP, except it's also, it's a, a workshopping series that just continues year round. And so, yeah, veterans submit their stories, like their first draft, and then we pair them with um, a mentor who helps them with editing. And then, and then we also have master classes for uh, the veteran writers workshop and then we uh, have a plan for the people in the veteran writers um, department to kind of move on from there whether it be in our incoming anthology or onto our incoming podcast so um, yeah there's definitely opportunities to grow within that so look into uh, if you go to our website so say we all online.com um, just look for the veteran writers division. And um, yeah, you can find out more about that. And if anybody else is interested, please do. You can also find the whole alphabet on our website, which is um, for LGBTQ plus writers. And um, yeah, I think we have, we have programs for everybody, everybody and anybody. So check out our website. Thanks, thanks, Jennifer. It's true, and these stories are for everybody. Um, uh, through this, I've had the opportunity to work and to listen to and hear the stories of um, one of my favorite ones. Was a couple of years ago, we did one uh, through. Um, I, excuse me for not remembering the name of the school in City Heights. Um, Reality Changers, Reality Changers uh, which is a great uh, opportunity for uh, kids who. Probably didn't set out to go to college, where this is a high school that encourages you, primes you to get into college. So it's a lot of kids um, who have stories to tell, but never had the opportunity to tell them. And I, and I, it was one of the, um, the, oh, what's the term? The, uh, oh, mentors? The, the, the kids of, of immigrants, what do you call them? Dreamers. The dreamers, excuse me. It's a word right in front of me. I worked with this kid and um, told me a story about, um, you know, his parents, like literally walking, like not like a hundred miles, but like over a thousand miles to get here. And um, him being born elsewhere and then coming here and then his parents um, settling down and creating a life. And this kid is like probably, not probably, but one of the smartest kids I've ever met. Um, I had umpteen degrees coming from, uh, from, from, from Google and all these other, Microsoft, all these other kid, uh, companies wanted to encourage him to go on into scholarships. And he's telling this story outside of the library in City Heights. And, um, I didn't see this coming and, and maybe, I don't I know he didn't, but like maybe a third into it, he just starts crying. Talking about his dad and, and, and um, what he went through and asking the question like, would I walk a hundred miles? Would you walk a thousand miles? It was just like, so great to be in the room with him and hear that. Um, and his parents are sitting behind me and it, it took all I could to not just, 
you know, break down crying and just like, this is so wonderful. Um, so proud of your kid. Um, so the side effects that we that we do when when these shows are put on are, are immense and they'll hopefully stay with you, you know, more than two hours after you leave the place where you hear these stories. That's just like a very small sample of, of, of the goodness that comes through this. There's just a lot of it, man. Um, very impressed by it. Um, we should get back to the stories. Did you guys hear that? That was my cat. <laughs> I want to torture you by putting her in the screen, but that, that's who that was. Um, <laughs> who do we have left in a rotunda? Thank you for, uh, for the things you said, David. That's, okay. that's really kind. I'd be um, so we have Tracy next. So whenever Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Tracy Starin. Tracy, I'm, you know, every time you come here and I see you, I just do nothing but laud about you. And I always wonder, like, she's probably sick of it, you know? Or maybe that's why she shows up, so she hears some more great things about herself. Tracy Starr lives in Queens, New York, and uh, we met her, I guess we started this Zoom business uh, just about 12 months ago, right? And, and um, I'm really glad that you show up, uh, despite your timeline. Uh, I've caught Tracy's stories on other forums. She performs uh, in and around New York City. Um, and thanks to Zoom, you can go international with this. Um, what do you have going on with your next as far as your, uh, anything you want to plug? Oh, that's enough. You're muted, Tracy. I think that's your connection. On Mars. Right. Okay, I'm going to be on, uh, but that's another story, the Toronto show in June, and then I'm going to be on Soul Stories Live in August. Very nice. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with geography, that's in Canada. <laughs> that's north of here, if you guys didn't know. You're welcome. Tracy, good to see you again. Um, good to see you. Okay. Yeah, um, whenever you're ready, you just go ahead and do what you do. Okay, thank you. So I, I came into the house through my grandparents' apartment downstairs so that I could say hello to them first. And then I came into our apartment up the back stairs and into the back door uh, the weekend I came home from college. And my stepsister, Nancy, and her husband and their two kids, including my one-year-old baby niece, were visiting. And so I dropped my bag and I took off my coat and I went into the living room to sit with my mother and my stepsister Nancy. And my dog, my little 10 pound fluffy Shih Tzu comes running into the living room and starts barking and furiously scratching at my sister Nancy. And this is very out of character for my dog. She's very lovable. And so my mother tries to calm her down but she's really not having it. And she keeps, she keeps pawing at Nancy and barking and running her back and forth and pawing at Nancy and barking. And we thought that maybe we couldn't figure out what was happening. There wasn't, I mean, it wasn't anything obvious. There wasn't a fire, nobody was breaking in. And uh, we thought maybe it was because Nancy was sitting in the spot on the couch where my mother sits every night. My mother was Taffy's favorite person in the whole world. So maybe she was being protective. So. My mother and Nancy changed seats so that she, my mom was back in, in her regular spot, but that did not quiet down the dog. And she continued to paw at both of them and bark and run in and out of the living room and the kitchen. She kept going from, the, from where we were in the living room into the kitchen and then coming back to us and barking and running back and forth and barking. And they couldn't figure out what was going on or why she was so upset and my mother kept, bending down to pick her up because that's all she ever really wanted in life was to be picked up and she didn't want to be picked up she kept wriggling out of it and my mother kept trying to pet her and she didn't want to be pet she kept she kept backing up and just really trying to, so they just decided, decided to try to ignore it and all of this happened in about 30 seconds and then finally the dog looked at me put one paw on my leg and barked at me just one bark bark and then she ran to the doorway between the kitchen and the living room and she looked back at me and she barked again, one bark and she moved on. 
I looked at my mother and I said, I think she wants us to follow her. And my mother looked at me with her eyebrows raised and said, oh, really? Because this was not Lassie. This was a Muppet. Shih Tzus, they're very lovely. They do not really have a purpose. They're not working dogs. They're not seeing eye dogs. They will not detect cancer. They will not guard your house. They're just there. And my dog in particular, her entire purpose in life was to be cute and lovable. And she excelled at that. It was the, she was the most lovable dog on earth. But really, it did seem like she wanted us to follow her into the kitchen. And so the three of us got up and marched after her into the kitchen where she was standing at the back door barking, where my niece was crawling backwards down the stairs through the open door that I had left open when I came in because we do not usually have a one-year-old baby staying with us. And my sister Nancy shrieked, which made my niece cry. And Nancy ran down the stairs and swooped her up. And nothing, it turned out, nothing, nobody, no, she wasn't hurt. Nobody had been harmed. And when the dust settled a few minutes later, we realized my little 10 pound ball of fluff of a Muppet dog had saved the day. When we looked around to congratulate her for her amazing feat of bravery, she was fast asleep on her blanket, exhausted from her day. Thank you. What's, what's your dog's name? Taffy. She's, she has crossed Rainbow Bridge now. Uh, good for Taffy. I mean, not for crossing, but for making an impression on everyone in the room that's never even met Taffy. My um, niece is 26 and is very sick of that story because <laughs> we tell it a lot. <laughs> right up, right up. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Tracy. Tracy, I had two Shih Tzus and I know exactly what you're talking about. They're, they're just like the sweetest, most wonderful cuddle dogs ever. Yeah, they're so great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. They're from- What the, were your dog names? Oscar and Cassie. Lovely. Oh my God. You know what's funny? My cat's name is Cassie. And when you said Oscar and Cassie, I swear to you, I shit you negative. She, she stood up on the table, like got up on her hind legs and was like, what? <laughs> wow, you have a cat that knows her name. Uh, well, it's dinner they time, so yeah, name. they do. They just don't answer to <laughs> <laughs> True. Adam, Adam, do you have any pets? Uh, uh, yeah, so I had... I had a cat um, just passed in January, actually, oh, um, but she was just sorry. over 15. So um, I've got her there on my TV, and I also have her tattooed on my arm. Um, of course you do. Thank you. That's great. Um, I just had a feeling. Why not, now, why don't you get another one? What's, what's holding you back? It's been you know, going on five months, right? Uh, we're, we're a little over four. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm at a point, I, I had her for her entire life, all 15 plus years. Um, and it, I, I wouldn't trade any of it. However, I want to do things and not have to worry about my cat, like who's going to take care of it or all this stuff. So I now get to travel, you know, and, and do the things that I wanted to do. So I may get one, but it's me time now. So right up. And that's what the cat says. It's all about me. Um, and she got all my time. That's good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And sorry for your loss, because it really does hurt. If you really love something, it's like, it really hurts more than you'd like to admit. And um, I can see the, the need for some tattoo ink for that. It's, um, it's, it's not easy. It's worth yeah. it, but it's not easy. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's such a great circle. Um, Marjorie, you had another story you, you were going to tell? Is that right? All right, Marjorie Pizzoli of uh, Pizzoli's Pizza and Pasta. That's the imaginary company that um, I made Marjorie the president of a couple of years ago when I first met her, uh, because it just sounds right. It just does. Um, what's going on with you, Marjorie? What are you plugging? 
Besides the uh, large cheese pizza for five ninety nine this month, what's going on? <laughs> well, I'm I'm zooming in from my artist in residence studio. That's my new credential as of twenty twenty. <sighs> And Very what's nice. really cool, so how I found out about Long Story Short was after you were the headliner at Palabra. And I had never heard of that concept before. I'm like, well, that's really cool. And kind of my motto in life now is jump in the deep end. Because I mean, I never even thought I was gonna do open mic poetry reading. So I was like, well, why not try Long Story Short? And it worked out because I had like the most ridiculous thing happen like two days before. And that's how I got started with you guys. <laughs> so oh, I want to say thank you. You and Ted Washington, um, you guys uh, in the room, made me feel really welcome there to, to go tell stories in a place where you tell poetry. Um, it, yeah, it's, I, it's a great thing that you guys do. And I think they're, they're very similar because they're things that come from your own truth either way. Yeah. Even if they rhyme or not. It's a yeah, I, I can't All remember right. my poems to save my life to read without my notes. But I was like, well, this is shit that happened to me. So, yeah, I can talk about that off the cuff. Why not try it? <laughs> so. well, welcome. Good to see you again, Marjorie. Whenever you're ready, you just let it go. <laughs> okay. So back to... Probably 1979 disco era when I was in high school and was sliding into the clubs because I could. <laughs> so this gets you the idea of what type of outfits were going on back then. And we it was it was Easter time and this was back on the East Coast in Delaware. And we were my friends and I, we were gonna go to Atlantic City to strut the boardwalk with our Easter bonnets. So I thought this was like gonna be really cool beans and what am I gonna wear? I really have to put some effort into this. And so I had, a, I had the hat and I asked my mom if I could borrow her purse and I had slingback pumps and my outfit, it was basically a disco suit. It was the shiny Kiana form-fitting jacket, skirt, and then I had the very delicate ruffled pink shirt, found the gloves, and I mean, I thought I was going to be the cat's meow, and back in high school, I was the shyest thing you could ever imagine. I mean, right now, I call myself a shy ham, but it was really bad in high school. So, I'm getting ready in the morning. I'm so excited. The night before I was at my friend's house and we were playing ping pong and all the good stuff. And I got home before my curfew because that was really important back then and put on my lipstick. And I think that this is just gonna be the most ultimate experience and day ever. So I get in my, um, 1965 GMC handy bus. <laughs> that was the only thing that didn't go with my outfit, but it got me there. But I decided there's a two hour car trip. I should stop at 7-Eleven and get snacks. Being the, you know, that would, that would just like top off the trip. So I push open the door. I mean, I felt like I was in a movie. And I saw people were noticing me. So this what made it even better. And that sound when heels are clicking on the, on the, the floors, I just thought that was like, this is, I, I am Audrey Hepburn today. Yeah. And I take my time going around. And then I, more people are in the store and I get in line and I'm, you know, I'm hearing people whispering and I'm like, they are talking about me. And I get up and I pay for everything and I head out the door and a gentleman opens the door for me and he gives me like the oddest look and I'm like, hmm, what, what's wrong? But it was like, nothing could be wrong. And I get to my girlfriend's house, open the door, saunter in, and all of a sudden everybody 
burst into laughter and I'm like, what? I said, just walk down the mirror, walk down the hallway and look in the mirror. So I am, oh my goodness. I turned around and I looked and my suit, it was a ivory cream color shimmery outfit. It looked like I shit myself. I'm like, what the hell? Um, excuse me. How in the world could that happen? And then I thought back to the night before because I had stopped at 7-Eleven the night before when I left my friend's house because I kind of had the munchies for whatever reason. And I got myself a Hershey's bar and I'm oh eating it in my car. And if you ever looked at a wrapper, well, there's little crumbs, but I mean, I didn't realize this until I went back out to the car and I looked and I saw the halfway eaten candy bar on the seat that I had thrown down. But when it was cold the night before with jeans, it did not stain anything, but Kiana's wash and wear. My girlfriends are always running late doing their makeup and hair. So there was time to do laundry. <laughs> so, off we went to Atlantic City and I had knocked myself off the pedestal, was a little bit humble and still tilted my hat just right as we strolled down the Easter parade. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> Thanks, Marjorie. Sometimes you gotta let it go, right? You gotta let it go. Uh, one day at work, um, I came into work and, and Dale had shit his pants. Um, but in Dale's defense, he's, he's 85 years old and he's incontinent. And, and most unfortunately, um, Dale also has Alzheimer's. Um, so it's my job to uh, look out for Dale. He's in this nursing home and it's my job to stay with him. Just make sure he's safe. But his, his family pays me just to sit with him. Um, and in times like this, when Dale shits his pants, it's also my job to help him, help him change. And um, I have really no problem doing that. I don't because sometimes I look at uh, in my job as people. I sum them up, and I'm like, "Would this guy do it for me? What I'm going to do for him? Change him out of his shitty pants?" Um, and Dale's that kind of guy that I'm like, I'm pretty sure he would do that for me. So again, I have no problem doing that. What I do have a problem with was, is that earlier that day, someone had dressed Dale and the pants he was wearing that now is shit in them were these, were these um, khaki uh, pants that you might work if you worked in a cubicle or some other horrible job. They had pleats in them. So they weren't like khaki pants, like Steve McQueen, cool khaki pants. They were more like, dress down day at some horrible company with pleats in them because they have pleats in them. They're just, they're horrible pants. So I get Dale cleaned up and I'm in his closet and I find this awesome pair, this suit, it's a track suit. It's an Adidas track suit, circa 1978. Maybe he bought it as a younger man, but he still had it. And it's just this cool suit. And I think almost anybody wears an Adidas black track suit with white stripes. Just looks cool automatically. And Dale looks cool automatically with or without this track suit. He's just got this great smile. And you can tell he's been winning women over his whole life based on this little smirk he has. It's really silent, but it's very effective. And I get him changed and um, he's good and he thanks me. Um, and we go to dinner and we're, we're at dinner time. And so there's this other thing that Dale ha that happens to people under this thing. And um, Dale starts to get agitated about it. And I don't know why, what it is yet. So I just have to listen. So I think a lot of my job is just listening. Why is, why is he upset? And if he tells me something where his Alzheimer's is speaking, he might, you know, the worst thing I can do is tell him that that's not true. Or we're not. What happens is, I find out by listening to him that Dale thinks that we're in an airport, but we're not, we're in the nursing home, we're in the dining room, we're waiting for dinner to show up at the table. 
but Dale's at an airport and he's got to catch a flight. I think it's to I think it's to Toledo because he used to have a business and he has to fly out there for business and take care of stuff. I said, well, what's wrong? He said, well, I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss the plane. And there's a the big clock on the, on the wall. So what time's your flight? And he said, it's at six and it's 530. And he can't find the tickets. So I reached my back pocket and I had an envelope that that I opened earlier before I left the house and it was my insurance bill telling me I was delinquent in my insurance. So I had this envelope and I take the envelope and I show it to him. I said, no, I, I got the tickets. Remember you asked me to get them and I got them. And he said, that's right. Okay. I said, yeah, we're, we got a half hour before we catch a flight. And he said, what about my bags? What about my luggage? And I look over and there's, um, there's a custodian pushing a vacuum. And I said, that guy's going to load the plane. The bags are over there. And he looks and he says, okay. And then we look to the other side of the room uh, where they're giving out meds. And I said, we still have to check in at the gate. The nurse behind the, in the med room is our flight attendant. And she's going to take our ticket. So I go over there and I hand her this piece of paper, which she has no idea why I'm doing it. But I just want to do it so Dale sees that we're... We're on schedule. We're going to make that plane. We're going to make it no problem. And then uh, a few moments earlier, he was he was pounding on the table and screaming, "God damn it! What the fuck? God damn it!" And he's he was so upset. And after doing that, he he calmed down, and we're just two guys in an airport now in the lounge having a drink, and we're going to catch our plane in a few minutes. We've got like twenty more minutes to go. And um, and Dale does that smile to me, that one he does his whole life that's really subtle, but it's really effective. And he says, thanks, man. And then he says, thanks, Henry. And now um, I happen to know that Henry was, was uh, Dale's brother, and, and Dale's brother died some years ago. But I'm not going to correct him, because telling Dale that his brother is dead is like telling him his brother's dead for the first time. And I'd rather wear a pair of khaki pants and shit in them than tell that to Dale. Thanks. Real good. You know, it's it's so funny. I just looked at my thing. I'm like, what if I was on mute the whole time? I was like, and you guys were like, <laughs> up here. Do we have any other stories? Or have we exhausted the room? Jennifer. No, He's I don't always, have one tonight. He always has one, but it's coming next month. Maybe. When we get to it, it's it's going to be a killer story, you guys. It's been like, right, like a year in the making. <laughs> it's um, going to combine all the past themes into right? one. <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm glad you guys could make it. Um, I want to talk about real quick about getting back in the same room together. I think that's coming down the pike and I think that's where this show uh, gets its real uh, gust from, its real uh, feelings from, its real uh, being in the same room and hearing these stories. And I always say this because um, when you're up there telling a story, there's this thing that happens uh, where maybe people laugh at part of your story and that feels good, right? We all want that. But there's this other thing too that, that happens when it's undetectable to any kind of audio, but it's this feeling of, of, of empathy in the room. And that's what I really miss the most is that feeling of like, we've all been there or whatever it is. It's just that feeling, you know, you've been in the room, you've been in any of these rooms where you tell stories, you just know that feeling where that's the part that feeds you. And that's the, that's the good part, you know, such so great. I do miss that. So um, who knows when that's coming, maybe this summer, maybe this fall, who knows? or anything has, has everybody been uh shot twice at least oh Tracy. i do want to say though that i i do want to say i i've really enjoyed that we've been having this digital pivot and that it's allowed us to all be together and like you said earlier david it's allowed for people like tracy to join us and i think it's it's been a really good um, expansion and connection that we've had with everybody. So um, yeah, 
I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you guys for showing up and, yeah. and uh, building this new expanded long story short family with us. Um, and if I could take one second to mention something to you all, we are currently going through a fundraiser right now. It's our spring So Say We All fundraiser and it's called Homecoming. So um, we have a website for it, which is just our regular website, but we've changed the, the page to a really cute graphic. Um, so if you go to so say we all online.com, uh, you can go there and get details for it. Or if you wanna go to just the really quick nitty gritty donate page, you can go to so say we all online.wildapricot.com dot org slash donate and I will put that in the chat because I know that's long but um, we would really really appreciate it if you've been enjoying long story short or any of our other programs if you could just donate whatever you can um, every little bit helps us continue our digital pivot and it helps us um, work towards getting into our live shows again and um, making sure we have all the streaming equipment that we need, uh, making sure that we can make uh, live shows COVID safe and everything like that. Um, so we really appreciate it. And I just wanted to mention that. So thank you again. I'm gonna type that in the chat here. Beautiful. I Thanks. To Thanks Jennifer for all you do. Thank you for your thank story. You. I really liked your story and I appreciated it because it was, interesting to listen to and it was also like a little education because I have some older people in my life and I have dementia and that really was graphic and um, to the, it was very helpful and enjoyable at the same time so thank you well I'm good it's nice to meet you Rita and, and I, I look forward to seeing you again all you guys um whether well, I've met you before I, I love you for for sharing yourself and doing that um and Hope to see you again at least in a month and looking forward to the real event and uh see you guys soon tracy don't tracy, forget to you submit you. your story to vamp and rita don't forget to find us on um veteran writers division uh marjorie adam submit to us also submit to us um and uh yeah we'll see you all again soon hopefully Thank you, Jennifer. All right, guys. Thank, be good. You. Thank you, David. So Thank good to you. see you. Thank you for giving me a Thursday to look forward to. Bye, guys. Bye, bye everybody. Love you. See you then.